Thanks, Raj, for having me over. Uh, none of it was done together. <laughs> and I just really don't believe in a concept called multitasking. I think it's, I think only some of the women here can do that really well. Definitely not me. No, I, okay. I will, I'm going to ask you this question to, right to begin with, right? Uh, a lot of the big startups are actually not made out of Gurgaon, but they're made out of Bangalore. Why have you chosen Gurgaon to be the place where you've built out most of your startups? Yeah, look, if you, actually that's an incorrect perception. If you were to look at, if you were to look at the sum total of uh, market cap, uh, with, if you look at Delhi NCR, and you were to add the sum total of market cap, I think Gurgaon beats Bangalore. I can no, send no, the no. calculation. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's an incorrect perception. I have some receipts for why you actually started uh, all your ventures in Gurgaon. Would you like to see it? <laughs> Please be right. my guest. So the real reason that Ashish started his ventures out of Gurgaon is this. Gurgaon has more liquor shops per square kilometers than, than ATMs. <laughs> and I think somewhere deep down you know that uh, Gen Zs are more motivated by partying than they are with, <laughs> with money. And you could build great teams out of here. But you know, uh, let me be honest, I don't think all liquor shops are selling genuine liquor, so I have to come to Koram. Oh. <laughs> Koram guys, you, could, you just got your <laughs> promotional snippet right there. <laughs> and they, ma they make the best uh, espresso martini, by the way. Oh, they do, they do. Uh, you know, we'll move from the conversation about alcohol to, uh, to you. And as part of, you know, uh, these fireside chats, something that me and my team do is, uh, we try to get into what makes a person tick, right? And uh, thanks to social media, we don't have to go too far. And luckily, you tweet a fair amount, right? So what we did was uh, we scoured your, uh, your tweets and we got a lot of insight into your guiding principles, your approach to entrepreneurship. And I thought that in this first section of getting to know you, we'll unpack a few of those. How does that sound? Absolutely. All right, cool. So for the first one, right, uh, how Ashish looks at life. Yeah, there's a tweet that you had put out. Everyone, you, can, you guys can look at the tweet there. Uh, the happiness equation. So before you kind of unpack that for us, right, uh, just a quick question here. What does happiness mean to Ashish? You want me to answer or yes. you want to, uh, everybody else? Okay. I want you to answer. <laughs> Yeah, look, I think a lot of people get unhappy with this whole equation of uh, failure, but uh, they do not bring the concept of, uh, you know, uh, learning. Learning is the positive side of it. Failure is the negative side of it. And uh, the mistake a lot of people make, and even I've made it many times, is that you don't fail fast enough. Because if you won't fail fast enough, you won't learn, you won't iterate, and then you won't win. So really it's about the equation of not just losing, but it's also the equation of learning and iterating. Yeah. And as a result, finally that leads to, you know, happiness because you win, because if you iterate. Right, you know, uh, when I saw this, I, uh, initially I, the question I wanted to ask you was that, hey, uh, this looks like uh, something of, you know, the happiness equation for Ashish the entrepreneur. Yeah, and, and sorry, I'm also deciphering yeah. it because when was, I wrote this like almost a year ago, right? So impact right so 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 the concept of impact is you know when people like us create a service create a product create a feature and that truly creates a lot of value for people you know when uh, on the road somebody would say listen ashish thank you for creating ind money because i could now invest in apple and google stocks which was not possible earlier that's true impact because we have made it accessible or when, you know, a small hotel in somewhere in Mahipalpur, the hotel owner would meet me at the airport. He would say, thank you for, you know, creating the system. It has helped me to increase my bookings by 30%. So that's like true impact. You're impacting the lives of people. For me, that equation is perhaps even more important than money. That, that's very insightful because, and that makes a lot of sense because, uh, because there's no... Uh, there's no mention of the word money there, right? It's, uh, it's happiness is more purpose driven. So I think that's a, that's a really good answer. Uh, I wanna move on to the next part, right? About let's say how Ashish approaches entrepreneurship. And uh, this tweet says, innovation happens in phases of ambiguity and chaos or at the edge of chaos. 
On the other hand, people love certainty, clarity, and predictability. I would like to ask you a question here, right? That for somebody who has probably operated at the edge of chaos way too many times, uh, how do you build yourself up in those situations when you are in the middle of chaos uh, to tell yourself that, look, this is how it's supposed to be done. Can you tell us from your stories, from your experiences, what that moment is like? Yeah, look, I mean, I think uh, firstly, uh, you know, uh, building uh, businesses or building anything is not linear uh, and very, very unpredictable because there are many things changing and many things going on in your life. It's almost like, uh, you know, for the men here who play football, it's almost like playing football or any sport, right? So when you're playing sport, you are combining skill and a lot of intuition and, and some kind of a judgment, right? When you're hitting the ball, you don't have the time to, you, you're, not, you're not a spectator in a stadium that you're looking at things, right? And yari aise maar deta, right? You're not doing that, right? You're, you're, you're playing the game along with your team. And you know, you are passing the ball. You don't have the time to look up. And it, is, it just needs to happen through a lot of iteration. It needs to happen through a little bit of a gut feel and intuition and there's chaos around, right? And what that creates is magic. The minute you try to build something in a very predictable manner, A, it is most likely going to fail. So do you all know the statistics of, let's say 100 startups start, how many fail? Anyone knows that statistic is a very interesting one out here. Four, it's four out of five, isn't it? So out of 100, how many fail? 99 fail. Okay, so that's the reality. And the reason is because everybody wants to follow the path of predictability, the path of something which is, you know, more certain. Uh, you talk to many people, they want predictability and certainty, but the reality of the world is not such. It is chaotic and it's going to change. So you want to try and be at the edge of chaos, not anarchy, but anarchy may kuch nahi banega, but really at the edge of chaos. And then you see that you know things are blossoming and things are kind of building up and things are kind of coming together. That's a really nice so answer. You, you, you yeah. typically orchestrate some bit of accidents. Okay, so operate at the edge of chaos but not going into anarchy, right? Uh, I just have a follow up to this as well. Uh, we are having this conversation that you know it's always chaos nowadays. Even today, as an entrepreneur, you're you're facing that. Uh, how are you different in when you are? you know, facing chaos in the office today as a mature multiple time founder versus let's say when you were doing it in your uh, earlier entrepreneurial yeah, afters. So, very good question. So I think, so as I said in the beginning, right, there is no concept called multitasking. You could do many things, but you can't do many things at the same time. So I essentially break up the problems into small parts and I simply prioritize. And I very quickly realized that out of those problems, some solutions need to be parked or killed or some ideas need to be killed. And then out of those two, three things, let's go behind it crazily. In the past, I would get emotionally involved with some of those ideas and solutions. And I would also, you know, as a very young person, lose my cool. So I wouldn't be very good with people. I would essentially, I think, be unreasonable which I don't think is the right thing to do. One has to be practical. So I think the, the new me is to break up the problems into parts, prioritize, and then attack. Right. You've also not been somebody who is a proponent of democratic decisions in the workplace, right? Uh, has that, is it something that's become stronger with time? Or is it something that you've kind of tried to adapt to that, hey, I want to be softer to the team, let it seem like that? How is your perception towards those decisions? See, non-democratization does not mean that you are doing bad things, firstly. I, I mean, I don't think any organization can run through a truly democratic process. True. I, it's just impossible. I mean, I, I think in a house also, imagine if you democratize decisions between a husband and wife, there'll be craziness, right? So, uh, you know, the buck has to stop at you or the founding team and, the, and decisions have to be taken for the right or wrong. Many organizations fail because they just don't take decisions, they don't change fast enough, they don't iterate fast enough. They are waiting for consensus from 50 people, 20 people. 
that is just going to waste time. World is changing. So mm -hmm. I think, I just don't think the best performing companies will have a democratized decisioning and actioning process. Fair enough. I think uh, now that we've gone through the first section of getting to know you, right? Uh, I'm going to just double click on, uh, on your entrepreneurial journey and some of the experiences there. Uh, Goai Bibo was acquired by MMT and it was, uh, you know, a big competitor acquiring another one. But uh, very little had been, has been said about it. I would love to hear what your mindset was around that time, you know, when you decided to exit and during that, uh, during that time. Could you give us some insight into what that process is like for a founder going through a category dominating kind of a merger? Yeah, look, I mean, I think it was difficult, very difficult. Mergers and acquisitions are very hard while they make people money, but it is perhaps the most difficult phase for uh, your core team and for the founders and even for the shareholders because everybody's kind of discussing, debating, sometimes arguing. Uh, so first thing is that, uh, you know, it is very hard. From the outside, it seems that, wow, things are really rocking. But from the inside, the reality is that there is, you know, absolutely upheaval in terms of emotions. So that's the first thing. And it's also very hard for the, for the teams on both sides, from the, from the both buyer and seller side, right? So firstly, it is very nuanced, very hard very challenging, right? Uh, we should not undermine. And in fact, one thing that I've seen is that a lot of organizations uh, in the pursuit of growth, they go and buy companies and they're not themselves ready. And which is why, again, another statistic is that nine out of or eight out of 10 mergers and acquisitions fail. They really fail. The money's written off completely. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that look at us as entrepreneurs, we can build the business in two ways. We can either build the business uh, like a boutique business. We can put our savings into a business and build it out. Or the other is that we can uh, take money from part of the money or some of the money or all of the money from investors. Investors can be institutional investors. Investors can be friends and families. Investors can be H&Is or whatever. So the route that I took in my last ventures was that we did take money from institutional investors. Now it's my duty. And then, the, of course, a lot of team members also get equity, ESOPs, etc. So then it's my job to unlock value. Now, how do you unlock value? You unlock value in two ways. One is that you either do a sale of the trade, you do a trade sale or a M&A, or you list your asset. So the decision we took at that time was that this is the right way to unlock value. And there are many reasons, right? I, I don't want to triple click on it in it, but it was a hard one, but it did create a lot of value for my team members. It create, created very good value for my shareholders. I feel good about it. Uh, I feel really bad about it to give up my baby. I still feel very bad about it. Uh, that's the reality. And I feel that was an, kind of an unfinished business, which is what motivated me to get going to start IND Money. Ashish, that was a very honest answer. So thank you for, uh, for sharing that with us. Uh, just as a, uh, you know, as a next question to some, which is related to this, you're someone who's built consumer tech businesses in, uh, you know, at the, at the time where VC money was just coming in, you, then when there was plenty of VC money, and now when VC money is drying up again, uh, can you tell us one really good thing about building a consumer tech business today in these times and one really bad thing about building a consumer tech business in these times? Yeah, so, so let me tell you, the best businesses are built when the markets are very bad. Okay, and I can tell you this is how we built GoIBO, this is how we built PayU, right? When the markets are bad, because when the markets are bad at that time, the bad actors are out of the game. When the markets are good, even a fool can raise money and then there is fight for talent. So a software engineer whose cost should be 20 lakhs suddenly becomes 40 lakhs. Economics of the business goes haywire. So the best time, and then of course, uh, our uh, friends at Google and Facebook in the best time make a lot of money because those advertising systems are a bidding and auctioning system. Uh, so they make a lot of money. So which means your cost of acquisition your user acquisition cost is suddenly doubled, your manpower cost is doubled, your rental cost in offices, everything is doubled. But when the markets are bad, that is the best time to build a business. And uh, you know, and, 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 and good 
good players need to really recognize that and double down during that time. Do it frugally. Once you build your product market fits, once you've built, you've, you've done zero to one, one to 10, 10 to 100 journeys, then you can of course scale, right? Because once you've hit 10 to 100 journey, then you're in the game. Right. What's the best time, you, you mentioned that's the best time to build a business. What's the best time to exit a business? So look, this is a difficult question because you know I don't know whether listing an asset is called exiting, but uh, you know my sense is that uh, if you uh, if you if you have commitments to return capital uh, and your business is doing re when you're winning and you have commitments to return capital to people, as in give them the XIRR in your language as a fund manager, then you should you should exit or part exit. Uh, I think most founders though now want to list their assets on the, on the stock exchange. It's become more straightforward, easier. Retail investors such as you guys are now more kind of understand the concept of investing domestically. So I think that's, the, that's what everybody wants to do. But I guess uh, if you want to list, you should be profitable, uh, bottom line profitable. I don't think we should be negative because that creates too much of wrong team pressure. Uh, on the other hand, when you do a trade sale or M&A, at that time your economics could be looking good, but you may be a beta negative because you're fighting with someone. Right. You know, uh, something you said actually resonates to, uh, to a conversation I had. Uh, this is about seven years back, I had a conversation with this gentleman um, called Apramya Radhakrishnan. Uh, he was the founder of Taxi For Sure and Taxi For Sure uh, sold to Ola for uh, $200 million. So I asked him this uh, same question, when is the right time to sell? And he told me this, he was like, the right time to sell is when you don't want to sell, right? Uh, and that's exactly what in retrospect turned out to be a really good deal for him as well. Yeah, look, I mean, I think in general, you want to create an asset which is going to live for a very long time, even if you're not running it. And you want to create a legacy as an entrepreneur, entrepreneur or a founder. I mean, today's date, still huge millions of people book on the travel app that I created lakhs and millions of merchants still use the payment system. So I, you want to create legacy for sure, besides creating wealth for people, etc. That's I think which is very important. In terms of exit decisions, there are like lots of variables at play. Uh, I'd like to ask this question. Uh, being a repeat founder, right? Everyone knows that there are a lot of advantages you get. Uh, you're on the top of the list for a lot of VCs. Are there some disadvantages to being a serial entrepreneur? Or sorry, to being a repeat entrepreneur? Yeah, I think the big disadvantage is that, uh, you know, uh, you don't, you, you, I mean, people like us don't fear short term failures, but we start like in the first one, you are okay to fail completely. In the second one, you want to avoid it, right? Because people remember the last thing that you did. So the fear of complete failure, disaster uh, is, 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 is not there in your first uh, venture, but is there in the second venture for sure. Is it because of some sort of a spotlight effect that people are looking at Yeah, you? I think people expect ki bhai, kuch banja, banna chahiye, right? Like something should be made out of this essentially. Right. No, I think, uh, and of course, you know, even our, uh, even our media has done a reasonable job of promoting a bit of entrepreneurs uh, on this front. Relatedly, you know, uh, you were at the Global FinTech Forum recently. Uh, I believe Kunal Shah had, had said this to, uh, to one of the reporters that we need to stop worshipping unicorns. Uh, we need to worship people with large profit pools and people who've created a lot of value through bootstrap businesses. Your thoughts? Yeah, look, I mean, I think uh, the days of this uh, celebration of unicorns is gone. Uh, what should be celebrated are the following metric. What are the unit economics? If some, is, does everybody understand unit economics here? If nobody understands, please speak to me. I'm very obsessed, number one. Number two is, you know, what is a repeat cohort looking like in a consumer business? That's, that has to be celebrated because let's say if a consumer starts buying from you, if a consumer is investing on your app, is that consumer continuing? So that every entrepreneur needs to be, uh, you know, very, very obsessed about. I think these are the two, and third metric which is important for at least a, a business like ours is NPS and conversion rates. These are the key metric. If these metrics are in place, you will create a very valuable enterprise. Right. The rest will follow. So, uh, okay. 
now if you are talking about building a big enterprise right let's say somebody in 2023 does not want to raise capital but wants to build a big business he wants to bootstrap it what would be your top piece of advice for that person yeah so i think uh, that individual entrepreneur or a team needs to uh, really find a way to get to a minimum viable product for a very small set of people who are who obsessively love that service so they don't need to worry about tens and thousands and millions of people to be acquired first thing they need to do is really build a minimum viable product basic working with even if it's 100 users but they should and they shouldn't be your best friends because best friends lie they should obsessively love your product and and obviously this will not happen in one go right this this it will be iterative i don't think anyone gets their product or gets their business right in one go it's very iterative so yeah so that's what they should do mm, very interesting i have a final question before we speak about investing and wealth management uh what were the key lessons that you learned as an uh, as a young entrepreneur which have now become foundational cornerstones of in money yeah i think so first uh, you know the most important lesson is that uh, uh, you want to surround yourself with great team you need to build a great team around you and i'm not saying large numbers but few good really good people the second thing is that you want to be honest to yourself many times we build stuff we fall in love with it with it but your customers are not in love with it your family is lying to you your friends are lying to you you got to be honest that listen ye chal raha hai nahi chal raha hai right and nahi chal raha hai to usko kill karo jaldi and change it right now in a business like ours that may not happen at a platform level but that may happen at feature level google sees so many failures every day you doesn't you don't even hear about them but that is really important you got to be honest i think mistake a lot of times even i have made is that you're just dishonest about it right? that's the that's the second uh, you know most important thing third is you know a lot of people say so when i was building goai vivo at that time a lot of people laughed they said yaar itne sare travel apps hain why are you building now also when we are building a wealth tech app oh there are 50 60 wealth tech apps when we started building why are you building what is so different these are very uh, i would say shallow questions so people should not get scared because honestly building creating new markets is very hard right let's say if you want to create a new culture new markets that's so difficult you want to play a game where markets are getting created there are tailwinds you don't want to get into things where there are headwinds so the the third thing is that never fear competition never fear that acha itne sare players hain i cannot do because there is so much that you can do in a product which and you can innovate so much even if some there are 50 other people trying to solve a problem because there is so so what we what i say to myself is always execution is greater than an idea idea everybody gets who can put it out there who can get the ground running faster who can solve problems better so i think that's the other very important cornerstone and and that's why your entire and, and sorry and the last thing is you know for me uh energy positive energy is more important than intellect so you will get a lot of intellectual people they will intellectualize with you ki yaar ye na ho nahi sakta sari intellectualization would be on why can't something happen but high energy high intent people will typically do hit and trial madness madly without doing too much of over analyzing and at the end of the day that's the game right you want to be in momentum you want to do hit and trial you want to see data of course you know you don't want to be stupid but that's why they win i think uh, there was a lot to unpack there right uh, and um, but suddenly i actually um, the what we spoke about in the beginning of this conversation right um, about how you look at happiness and how you look at entrepreneurship it suddenly all tied up together because uh, it's uh, it just came to me that i think aristotle or somebody said that happiness is a chief good and uh, it's the pursuit of excellence through through repeated interactions and feedback loops that actually gives you true fulfillment and happiness in life 
so i like that how it all ties up in uh, in your in the way you actually approached your entrepreneurial life so we're going to uh, we're going to pack that session on one side uh, on the entrepreneurship side of things and we're going to take it to the next gear and speak about investing and wealth management right um, and the first question is actually something that i'm guessing everybody here is going to be interested in uh, and the question is what are some of the mistakes that wealthy individuals make while investing and they don't know it yeah i guess uh you know they don't asset allocate properly they don't rebalance properly they rely on sometimes an advisor who does not who's who does not have the wherewithal to advise you got to learn on your own because if he knew how to make money for you he would make money for himself first why would he be sitting at your doorstep uh so i guess these are the these are the things right like like getting like this whole concept of you know there is going to be an rm and he's going to solve my life i'm not too sure how how it works uh and finance you know i i don't come from a finance background but the problem is that these guys who were in the finance industry they uh, played the game of information arbitrage which means make things complicated throw jargons repo rate i didn't know what repo rate is right aaj se 4 5 saal pehle what repo rate and all of that stuff is being thrown at you and then you say yeah there's something complicated yeah let let me do what he's saying actually it's very simple it's simpler more it's more simple than cooking it's really really simple so people like out here should gain knowledge it's very easy to do asset allocate simple don't put all your eggs in a single basket asset allocate uh allocate more and more of your allocation should be more towards uh, you know uh, passive and some bit you say okay 5% of my money i'm going to put in risky bets i'm going to put it in venture i'm going to put it in startups etc etc but not like going and putting 10 or 20% of your wealth so yeah i think these are the things asset allocation gain gain knowledge passive investing you know uh, some of these things that you've mentioned are genuinely very simple right but in investing simple does not always translate to easy right uh, and a lot of that has to do with financial discipline and uh, the more you get into it you realize that most people can actually spot a right trade but don't have the discipline to stick to it or the market is built in such a way that it will always shake out the weaker actors right it will uh it will go up it will go down and it's going to test your conviction if you if it's shallow i want to hear from you how end money is actually helping people build that discipline for long term investing yeah so i so you know let me actually start with this story right so end money started as a platform for the affluent of this country the top of the pyramid that's how you know i had envisaged it because i could relate to the problem because i would have these uh offline wealth management companies and banks coming to me and giving throwing these jargons and confusing me so i said look this this can't be true right this has to be simpler and when i say investigating i said look this is really simple it's just the money is being made out of information arbitrage right and then as a result the birth of in money happened uh, and as we scaled in money i started realizing that india needs to have or finance needs to get democratized investing needs to get democratized people need to access markets so i guess from our vantage point it's very simple we are the app basically it's an app based diy right people download the app uh it automatically understands the profile so if somebody is a wealthy hni the pro personalized experience would be different if somebody is uh, is someone just starting work life the experience would be very different and the persons are able to basically do everything the kyc on the app they are able to get started they are able to choose whether they want to invest globally whether they want as in do they want to invest in google facebook all of these companies that we use day in day out do they want to invest in etfs and index funds in india they are able to do that and they are able to see the allocation and not just that they are able to also pull all the investments all the all the wrong doings they may have done in the past they are all able to pull it in a single dashboard and the dashboard is the core glue of our product uh and it's and it just basically gives them insights every day every every week and people feel massively in control so it's a it's a pretty loved product now as i said you know that's an important aspect in your journey product should be loved uh you know it's a 4.7 rated app on ios 4.5 rated app uh, you know it's in the hands of 7 or 8 million people 
So that's what the product does, right? Very simply, those things that I talked about, it helps you to not put all your eggs in one basket, which is allocation, which is really important. Number two, it democratizes. So it breaks out jargons and makes it very simple, A, B, C, D. And, uh, you know, and it just makes, gives you the whole empowerment. In one click, you can withdraw. One click, you can add money and invest. No, very interesting. And, uh, and definitely, in money has been very helpful. Uh, what I'm also curious about, you know, in, uh, given our demographic, uh, we're a $2,500 per capita economy, uh, GDP per capita. GDP per capita. Uh, we are seeing that distribution fees is coming down. There's, a, there's downward pressure. Uh, competition in this wealth tech industry is increasing. Um, I'd love to hear where do you feel that long-term sustainable profit pools lie for the future of uh, wealth management companies? Yeah, so I, I guess uh, typically the traditional wealth management companies uh, make, traditional wealth management companies make money through uh, distributing financial products like AIFs, PMSs, and mutual funds, and they make commissions. Uh, pro some of the products like AIS, PMSs are very high expense ratio. And as a result, the wealth manager who's coming and selling that product to you uh, is making huge amount of commission. And not only making that huge amount of commission in the first year, but making it every year. So which means if you put one crore rupees into that financial product, that individual or his company is almost making three lakh rupees a year from you. Now, let's say if you're invested for five years, you do three into five is 15 lakhs, and then you compound, you suddenly compound the cost. Not, okay, there's an investment compounding, but you also compound the cost. Suddenly, that 15 lakh rupees is looking like 22 to 25 lakhs. So just imagine you spent 22 to 25 lakhs have got wiped out on your principal or one crore, which is just plain inefficient, which is why a lot of you guys will notice Unless the fund manager, the guy who's manufacturing the AIF, is a rock star, you will, and if you, you will find it hard to beat passive. Very, very hard. And look, some of it is my view. This is not advice. So you guys do your own research. So my view is that this is going to get disrupted. 100%. I mean, I think people will gain this understanding from products like us. They will, there's more and more information out there. So this is going to go to ground zero, this fee. I'm not talking startup, et cetera, because there there's huge cost of due diligence, pipeline building, et cetera, but especially when, pub, when investing is happening in public markets, right, where there is so much of democracy of information. So I think this is going to become zero, and hence uh, there are going to be revenue pools in advisory, but the issue is that psychologically, uh, a lot of you guys don't like, so I talked about the, tw you know, 20, tw 25 lakhs compounded money, right, which you guys paid. But agar wohi paise, if that guy will ask you, you'll never like to pay that. Or let's say if he says, if, if, let's say even if it was half of it, you won't like to cut a check, which is the whole, I mean, what I look at it is a money workflow issue. But otherwise, it's a pretty interesting, if, if the regulator allows the money to be settled as a part of the purchase of investment products, I think advisory is a pretty nice thing because you would end up buying commission-free products. So, but that revenue pool to unlock the regulator needs to change. I don't think that's happening in the short term. Other than that, uh, you know, you have, uh, uh, you know, in the wealth management industry, you would have some honest insurance products. You would have, you know, a discount brokerage uh, such as companies like us, which are very, very low and high volume, right, where millions of transactions happen and then doesn't hurt anyone, which is our model essentially. Or, or essentially you will uh, create uh, credit lines and lending solutions for people, which is pretty high margin, net, in net interest margin businesses. But I guess the traditional wealth management where there are large commissions, that's in for clear, I mean, that's going to hit ground zero. So uh, my suggestion is even if somebody's going to become an AMC or manufacturer, go zero, zero fee, make money out of performance. Very interesting. 
my next question, uh, right before I asked the question, I realized that I forgot to give a disclaimer to the audience. Uh, none of this is investment advice. Please consult your, uh, your advisors before, uh, because it's a recorded session. And the reason, yeah, <laughs> the reason I'm going to, uh, the reason I gave this disclaimer is because my next question is actually going to be about Finfluencers. How many people follow Finfluencers here? Or do investments based on what some influencers say? Anybody? Come on. I'm sure. See, one honest person. <laughs> okay. Uh, so look, I think uh, the question I have now is that Finfluencers, finance, finance influencers are getting a lot of heat nowadays, right? Uh, and a lot of that is from mainstream media. And the interesting thing is that, uh, you know, about three, four years back, the same media was actually touting these influencers that, hey, these guys are, you know, democratizing investments and whatnot. Um, and one of the influencers has actually written about this, uh, that this was only in the case when these guys were smaller. Now there are influencers who have 2 million, 3 million uh, subscribers, and they are basically crouching on the territory of these media outlets. So the, the entire thing has come around that, you know, hey, these guys should have a RIA license and whatnot, and they should be SEBI registered. Now, I'm not taking sides here, but uh, the media outlets don't have those SEBI registrations either. And they've been, you know, giving that kind of financial advice for years. Right. Uh, given that you are somebody who interacts with even influencers and the media, your thoughts on this subject? Yeah. So, so let's first understand what the regulator is saying. So what the regulator does not like is that anyone should like, I should not get up here and start inducing you to buy a particular security or I should not start inducing, let's say if I were an influencer, which I'm not. So I should not induce you to open an investment account or I should not induce you to buy an underlying security, actual security. But the regulator is very happy if I come and educate you. But no, very unhappy when I try to peddle a security and when there is kind of insider trading going on and when, you know, especially penny stocks where the uh, Finfluencer is saying that, listen, you buy this X or paise ban jayenge aapke, right? And promising returns. So that is something which the regulator is very unhappy about and that has happened. So I think there are two kinds of influencers. One is influencers who are educating consumers, who are, who would typically educate consumers about, uh, you know, the core features of an application or would educate people about core financial concepts. What is inflation? What is ETF? What is index fund? What is compounding? How does it work, right? So that's one kind of education which is very valuable. What is not right is uh, selling a security like a TV shopping network, coming and saying buy Z, X, Y, and especially these penny stocks because there's a lot of gaming possible low, low volume stocks, right, basically. Actually, any security. Uh, so that is where the problem statement is. It, is akin to almost, uh, you know, insider trading. It, it influences people, right? right? So, and they don't want inducement to happen because a lot of people end up losing money or somebody, somebody's teaching someone, oh, I, you know, I, I'm doing FNO and I made so much of money. The reality is a large, pe large percentage of people lose money on FNO. Right. And that is what the regulator, so regulator's job is people protection. So what is the regulator saying? I want to protect investors' interest, one. Second thing the regulator is saying, I do not want fraudulent people to open accounts with companies like us or offline companies, which means KYC is extremely important because in India there is a lot of impersonation which happens. In India there's a lot of people who do fraud because there are very smart people. And the third thing regulator is saying is no money laundering should happen because this becomes a great way. So how do you ensure? So these are the three, and fourth thing is of course, investor grievance. These are the four things that the regulator is saying, is, and it's a pretty progressive regulator, by the way. I'm personally very, very impressed. And uh, so net-net, you know, there are of course, uh, influencers who are peddling uh, these kind of uh, buy at one time, you know, and there are, there are others who are actually educating. Net net, do you think they have a positive impact on society, or uh, is that something? Yeah, I, yeah. I think the ones see. No, I think net net, there could be some negative, and 
the regulator regulating or creating a framework would be good. Uh, I guess a lot of media outlets, you know, now that you talk about, let's say, CNBC, it's talking a lot about stuff and securities. Do they have a research analyst license? I need to check. It's a good point. I'm going to check that. Because at the end of the day, uh, an influencer on YouTube is pretty much like a anchor on CNBC TV 18. Yes. We should all check that. I'll check that. And I'll come back to you. Yeah. But I guess that these guys should have some kind of a license to be able to uh, communicate, to be able to be governed and regulated, both, both on the media side and on the influencer side. Right. You know, I think uh, in general, just listening to media commentators and making investment decisions, uh, that's, that's just a rookie mistake, isn't it? You yeah, I, always... think, I think the media, if I'm not mistaken, what the media, the, the, the traditional media, right, like CNBC, etc., what they are saying is that Morgan Stanley said this, or Motilal said this, and the, what the brokerage houses said, or what the research houses said, I think they're saying that. I Unlikely that they say, oh, I'm saying this. Mm -hmm. Unlike what the influencer says, I'm saying this, ye FNO karlo. Right, so I think that is what they're saying, but having said that, even they and the normal influencers and influencers should be under regulatory ambit. I agree. So uh, we're gonna move to the next section of our conversation, which is a little bit more fun. It's a pop quiz. Okay, I'm not right. good at these quizzes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, right? Uh, we're gonna start with this very simple one. You have to tell me the first word that comes to mind when I say, oops. When I say the word intoxication. Mm. Excitement. Okay. First word that comes to mind when I say health. Wealth. When I say wealth. Health. <laughs> <laughs> the first word that comes to mind when I say personal brand. Equity. Can you elaborate? Personal brand is like equity, right? Your personal equity. Okay. That the value can... of that equity, right? How do you unlock that? How do you unlock that value? By creating. Okay. First word that comes to mind when I say the word entrepreneurship. Impact. Oh, good answer. All right, next section is fill in the blanks. The best Indian startup founder in my opinion is? Okay, now that's a difficult one, right? Hmm. I think, uh, okay, you guys want to give me a minute to think yeah. about it? Mm. Suggestions? I, I think the InfoEdge founders, both of them, Sanjeev? Sanjeev and Hitesh, I think they're one of the best founders. They've built a very good institution and they've also invested in some of the best assets. Okay. What about your competitors, the Kamath brothers? I don't think of them as competitors because they have 6 million investors. India addressable market is 2 or 300 million, right? So we got to write our own playbook. In fact, I tell my team, please don't ever look at Zeroda. We never looked at Make My Trip. We never looked at Build Desk when we were building PayU. We need to create our own playbook to be able to really democratize and give access to the capital market. See, India's even whatever mistakes we as a country would do, India is going to grow a lot. And if India is going to grow, we got to give access to people, like normal people to access the Indian markets. Why should, like in the past, only wealthy win? Everybody needs to win. That's just a joke, by the way. <laughs> All right. The best TV show or a movie about startups and entrepreneurship, in my opinion, is? You know, I thought uh, the movie, I forgot the name of the movie, but the whole face, it was the, the Facebook story was uh, really social interesting. Social network. Social network and the other one was the We Crashed. I thought We Crashed was actually the yeah, best. Yeah, We Crashed was really good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Oops, sorry. If I were to do another startup, uh, it would be in the Dash space. Oh, this is easy, right? It will be in the health insurance tech space. Uh, you can refer to uh, Ashish's latest LinkedIn post for this, for the backstory to this. You want to you wanna double click on that a little bit? Yeah, so I think it's pretty simple, right? Uh, so I had, a, I had to visit the hospital because my daughter contracted dengue. And I thought to be safe, let me just check her in. And uh, went in and kind of checked her in. And then 
there was this whole process which was like a circus. So I'm going to the hospital to get her admitted and then there is this thing called TPA, which was like a, which was, it felt I've come to India in 1985. Everything has turned gray around me, right? They were making me fill forms and so on and so forth. And then it was a circ circus of approvals. And then on the day of the discharge, it was worse. And I really uh, kind of reflected and I thought this is so broken. And the way to solve it is, uh, I'm not saying any solution is simple and I'm not saying it's gonna succeed, so please, do your own research. But I think the way to solve it is that you need to launch your own first party underwriting health insurance company. You cannot be a broker or an aggregator. You need to do that. And you obviously it's, there is licensing, et cetera, but now the regulator is pretty open and you need to completely build it fully digital with proper machine learning to be able to do underwriting. And so that let's say when you go to the hospital, You'll always do it like a QR code, UPI transaction, click, approved, everything done, and you're just checking out like that. And that's absolutely possible if you're a first party health tech where you are integrated with the hospital management system, you, are, you, are, you have AI based underwriting systems, and that operates at scale. So look guys, he's thrown out a business idea for you guys. And for, somebody's for building, building it out. Yeah. I'm sure you'll invest. <laughs> I would. All right, next. India will be a dash trillion dollar economy by 2030. Look, I don't want to, again, this uh, could have compliance issues if I'm going to project, but yeah, really? I mean, we really? are like, yeah, yeah, we, we, can't, we can't do many things, by the way, as a regulated company, but definitely uh, my sense is that India will not, by 2030, India will not cross China, for sure. Uh, I guess, I can definitely say that the per capita GDP uh, of India should cross 4,500. 4, and at that time, magic is gonna happen. Fair enough. All right, so the last section before we open for audience questions is something really interesting, okay? And uh, we pulled out uh, a picture of you from when you were 20. Okay. So the wow. last section is the uh, is pieces of advice that you would give your 20 year old 20 year old self oh sorry i missed one fill in the blanks question dash is my favorite finance investing app other than end money oh, okay investing app no i don't have any like i use i, I eat my dog food really really <laughs> aggressively okay i'm still going to hold you to an answer what yeah. else do you use other than end money so so obviously before before in money, I was using at least eight or 10 tools right from the, the banks, brokerage app, Kotak Securities, uh, HDFC Securities, Zeroda, eight to 10 of them, right? So not, not Never happened, and that's why you built in money? Perhaps, yeah. All right, fair enough. All right, final section, advice to your 20 year old self. One piece of advice that Ashish of today hmm. would give the 20 year old Ashish, by the way, that's 20 year old Ashish. Huh? And mm. we pull this out again from his social media. Mm. One piece of advice that you'd give the 20 year old Ashish about- Don't money. ever, don't ever have such pictures. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a nice picture. Okay, about one piece of advice about money that you'd give your 20 year old self or 20, 20 year old here. Yeah, I, I guess, uh, you know, the, you know, when you want to get into entrepreneurship earlier, you would do it, better it is. The, the typical way we, or at least people like me who grew up, we will first do education, then we will do some work, then we'll do more education, then we'll do some work, then we'll do more education, and then we'll do it. I think that world has changed because the way even a 20, 21 year old can imagine problems and solutions is just unparalleled. And if you really want to truly create impact, it takes a long time. So earlier you start. So I wish I had started my entrepreneurial journey in 20s and not 30s. You know, very interestingly, we had uh, Ashish Mohapatra here a couple of weeks back. He said the same thing to me. He said, like, I wish I had started earlier. Mm. Uh, do you think it's also because uh, we are in an age of getting so much information? Information is more democratized now. So it's easier to learn uh, than it was maybe say about 20 years yeah, back? Look, so it's interestingly, you know, uh, I don't think when I was born, the market was ready. The country was struggling. That $2,500 of per capita GDP that you talked about was worse, right? Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, so creating uh, anything in a country like India, honestly, this honestly, to kuch bhi kar lo, mm. honestly was very hard. Uh, even even the first four five years of me having started the previous startups, getting the first thousand users was nightmarish, and then getting the next five lakh users was like cre- like we celebrated five lakh users. Uh, in, at In Money, we got the first million users within months, no advertising. Hmm. Whereas, so it was a very different phase. The people didn't want to work in a startup. They wanted to work for Infosys. They wanted to work for Satyam, which is dead now. They wanted to work for companies like this. A lot of people took pride in working for Microsoft. They, you know, is, startups were looked down upon, and people like us were starting up. Akele to nahi sakte. We need a team. So it was hard. But having said that, I mean. The one thing that I regret is that I wish I'd started earlier, even though I would have gone through lots of ups and downs, right? When did you start up exactly? I started, uh, I started right after Google at the age of 30. That's not too bad at all. <laughs> all right, one piece of advice that, you, that Ashish of today would give the 20 year old Ashish about career. I think you've touched upon that now. I've touched upon it. Like, look, I think uh, you cannot, we cannot live this horrible life that I will do X education, then I'll do post graduation, and I'll do something else. Right? That is linear. That world has changed. What about you know a lot of people thinking that hey, let me get this exposure experience in this space or in this area, then I will be ready. Uh, is that just fear, or you just have to uh, overcome that? No, I think that's fair enough, right? Like you know, what I feel really proud of is that the number of entrepreneurs that. IBO created, the number of entrepreneurs that PayU has created is just immense. Just imagine, I have at least 30 or 40 people who've gone out to build companies. And the reason is that they got primed, they learned the ups and downs, they learned, the, they learned, all, they learned some of the art, and today's date there are so many entrepreneurs there, right? Like Shalaz Nag of XPayU is building .pay a very good service. I don't know if any one of you guys have used. Another, my ex-CTO, Vikalp is building EkaCare, a health tech platform. Right, yeah. uh, Nitin Gupta is building Uni, it's p- pivoting, who was the head of the PayU business. And similarly, so many of them. And similarly, uh, lots of team members have come back to work with me, some of them as my co-founders. So the amount of value creation that happens is gonna be immense. So I feel very proud of really helping or create at least 15 to 20 such startups. Wonderful. Uh, my final question, which is something that, uh, again, the final one piece of advice that you'd give your younger self today about relationships. Uh, that's a tough one. Like, I'm gonna preface this a little bit. Mm. Uh, the reason I say this, right, is because uh, I, I've been in the ecosystem for, uh, for a while now, and I've seen very successful people, but I've also seen a lot of uh, relationships which have gone up in flames because of that ambition, right? Uh, and they've not been happy people thereafter. So that's something which I've seen from close quarters and I wanted to get your uh, insight on how okay. do you balance that kind of ambition with your personal life and relationships. So you're talking about personal relationships or professional relationships? Personal. Yeah, look, okay, so so, so here's the thing, right? So if you, if you want to succeed, so there is a, people really cry about this work-life balance, right? So first is I, I personally don't believe in this concept of work-life balance because if you're smart, you will figure it out. Second of all, uh, you know, you got to divide and conquer w- with your partner. I'm here thinking, is this relationship with your partner, relationship with your friends, relationship with your- Probably with your partner. Okay, so you got to, you got to divide and conquer, right? So one of, the, one of them, you know, especially if you are the first time entrepreneur, one of them has to kind of say that, listen, you go for it. Go all in. And you have to go all in, right? There is no tomorrow. Um, and we, there has to be a uh, healthy balance between the two. So what would you tell your 20 year old self about uh, balancing relationships? So when I was 20, I didn't have a work life, all of these issues in any case, right? But, but for your future self. But look, I mean, I think, no, I, I did fine. 
I did fine, right? Like Kavita is here. Did I have to do fine? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to open up for some audience questions. Yeah. Uh, where's the mic? Questions for, for Ashish? Uh, so, uh, someone building in this consumer uh, business, uh, CAC is definitely one of the biggest challenges out there. So, while starting in money and even now, how do you look at the CAC issue out there where uh, we know how much CAC generally uh, other competitors had uh, have? So, yeah, how do you look at uh, that issue? Yeah, so I, I, it's, a, it's a, uh, a very important holy grail. Uh, so, there is a concept of CAC, which is for the uninitiated costs of user acquisition. And then there's a concept of average revenue per user. So the way we look at it is that your average revenue per user in an annum should be greater than cost of acquisition. That's how we look at it. Uh, now your next question would be, how do you make that happen? So the way you make that happen is you create much better converting funnels. So in our case, the two most important funnels are KYC funnel and the other is the investing and add money funnel. So these funnels need to convert beautifully. There is too much of tech, art, I mean, it seems trivial when I tell you like this, but there's too much going at the back uh, and very, very hard problems being solved to get these conversion funnels right. So these are the uh, two important metric to follow. I'm, I'm gonna help you out a little bit. Uh, just a follow-up question to, uh, to the gentlemen's here. Um, the the bigger problem nowadays, especially with funding drying up, uh, is the realization that customer acquisition was unsustainable to begin with. So if these companies had not raised capital and if they were putting money out of their own pockets, they would have never spent that much money to get a user, somebody that they could not monetize over and above that. Uh, so, so I think, so look, what was happening in 2020, right after COVID, uh, there was a lot of capital dumping that happened in India. And there was so much of capital, even a fool could raise capital. And then everybody was spending money and the justification amongst every amongst your investors is that, listen, I, I will spend 1000 rupees on a user. I will one day make 2000 rupees from this user. Right. That one day. And the term used is lifetime value. I think that LTV concept is kind of dead now. And now with now, as I said, good businesses get built during constraint time. Uh, you know, the, the way we look at it is simple. Average revenue per user. What is the revenue that he gives us every year? And what is the cost of acquiring him? Blended cost of acquiring, right? We get a fair amount of organic users. The way we had played this game, we were kind of building during COVID. We hadn't really built our platform out. We had raised capital. The way we thought about it is that, listen, can we first get our first 5 lakh to 7 lakh users without spending money? Because that's a good proof hai na, that people love your app. Which means we didn't spend any money at all. Which means that our ARPUs were X, whereas our CAC was zero. Then the next phase, we said we'll do referral. Which means your CACs are very, very small because people who love, they'll refer. Then we said we'll do referral with incentives. Then there was a little bit of, now we are at a phase where we are saying, listen, we built our revenue streams. Now we got to distribute the app. So we are pushing it hard, but even this during this distribution phase, and you will see us more visible over the next 12 months, 24 months, you would not see our uh, CACs crossing our ARPUs. Very interesting. Any questions? What is the maximum amount that an investor can invest in US stocks? So Sorry. the maximum amount an investor can invest in global equities is $250,000. And this $250,000 is about how much in rupees? Uh, 1.9 crores. 1.9 crores. Uh, this includes, let's say, if this, this money includes sending the money for investing purpose, or let's say if you were to send money to your relative, or you were to send that money outside to someone for some purpose. So it's a sum total of 250,000 per annum per family member. And you have a tie up with, with which uh, like 
in so, US, supposing I'm so, just yeah, US. So the way our workflow works is that you come and open an investment account on InMoney. And after that, you, uh, so you do your KYC, et cetera. Uh, we enable you to open a new digital bank on our app because the problem statement is not just ki mere ko paise lagane hai, but the problem statement is also movement of money Correct. and cost of moving the money. Hmm. So that's where we really structurally innovated, where we said that in that KYC journey, a digital account opens up because that's the account from where your money flows out. That's the account where the money comes back. That's the account where you get your dividends and all of that stuff. Uh, in US, we have partnership with four settlement houses. That's how uh, you know it operates. Uh, there are various uh, uh, settlement systems out there. There are five or seven of them. Some of the no known names are people like Alpaca and uh, DriveWell. These are regulated in US uh, by FINRA, which also gives us a lot of comfort, but we also have good visibility. Uh, okay, my, sorry, one more question. So I have this account with ICIC Direct and they have a tie up with Morgan Stanley. So I want to understand, of course, ICIC charges a lot of fee, yeah, like so moving is, money yeah, and yeah, getting yeah, the money yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. So when you're talking of the tie ups that you have, they are all regularized with the US and the Indian government. Correct, correct. So we have, uh, we have a digital bank. At the back, we have Federal Bank, which is a very large bank which is regulated by RBI, when your money flows out from that bank, from your native bank to that bank to out, it is flowing back, flowing out in even much more regulated fashion than what it happens with ICICI. And it doesn't happen at the costs that you have to incur with ICICI, which is why this whole concept had not got massified, right? Because it was very broken. You have to go tell your, in this case, I'm sure you tell your RM ke paise bhej dena. Paper sign hoga, uh, and, and they don't have this much limit also. The limit the limit with ICIC Direct is much lesser than what you're saying. Uh, no, the, 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 limit, the limit is $250,000 yeah. under the liberalized revenue the, scheme. The, 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 the liberalized yeah. remittance scheme. Yeah. yeah, but besides that, yeah. if, if we are not using that scheme, then the limit is much lower. I mean, there is a restriction. They, they don't allow that much money. Be but what bank. I want to know is, what is your fees uh, sending money and back? Compared to any so, other. Yeah, so, yeah, so bringing the money back, it's free. And then uh, sending the money is less than half a percent. Okay, every time. Yeah, every time. But there's also now TCS, right? So 20% so, so TCS is is an above, 7 lakhs. TCS is above 7 lakhs, which, is, which you can adjust in your quarterly returns. Okay. Which also we compute real time on our app. Okay, thanks. Hi, um, I'm a very regular user of the app. I love what you've done with it. Uh, I was wondering whether there's any uh, plans to introduce some kind of tax planning uh, advice, you know, because I mean, like I said, I follow these influencers. I don't invest, I just don't just take their word, uh, but uh, I do my research. But I saw some uh, creative ways to reduce your tax liabilities. That's something that IND Money is planning to introduce as well. Yeah, look, I mean, I think this is a great point. And uh, one of the things that I personally want to do, I want, so taxation mm -hmm. for all the people. So, 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 okay, let me take a step back, right? So if you, if you have a salary income, taxation is simple. You get a form 16 and taxation is super simple. The minute you become an investor, whether you're investing globally or domestically, tax suddenly becomes very, very complex. And another thing which IND Money does is that not only it enables you to invest and save, but it also enables you to pull all your accounts in a single place. All of your accounts in a single place. So that actually gives us a lot of right to make taxation, taxation computation, and taxation hacks, legal hacks, as in harvesting, loss harvesting and harvesting. Absolutely, that gives us a huge right to deliver to the audience at large and make it free, absolutely free. And that's so much in line with our theme of democratizing, but the complexity here is that we are talking to the income tax department to give us certain APIs, which they have, since they've moved to Infosys, they've kind of blocked it, um, uh, but we are chasing them. Once they give us the APIs, we'll just make it 
we'll just put full power in it and just make it easy. I don't think, in, like I struggle with my taxation every quarter. Like, a, like you have to go running pillar to post. Every quarter you're begging the, begging someone for your interest certificates, your, your statements, and then, you, then your CA is calculating. We can automate the whole damn thing. And we can also say, okay, now you harvest this much and do X, Y, Z. So it's, it's, it's absolutely on the cards, but we're just going step by step, right? Because whatever we do, we do have to integrate, uh, you know, get the buy-in of the folks uh, at the income tax department, although they have APIs which they've given to others. So it's not something which we'll be taking, uh, something special that we'd be taking. Any final questions? Thank you. Uh, basically, what are the parameters do you look before investing into a startup? Especially, like, uh, you want, uh, your fund should be at least safe. Like, uh, I've, I'm really, like, uh, confused. I have uh, two startup founders. One is, like, uh, he is having a good revenue. Second is there's a young guy, and he is making something which is, like, really amazing. And right now, nobody has actually done it. So, what's your... Yeah, so I think uh, I'll be very honest with you. Uh, investing in startups is very risky. It's the highest risk asset class unless you're doing a pre-IPO investment. So you should be aware that you're, you, should, you should in your mind say that, listen, this capital of mine can reduce or finish. And it's also not unlike, let's say, when you invest in equity, on BSC, NSC, or US market, you can just sell and take out your money. It is not the case, right? So first thing is that the, you use the word safe. You should take that word safe out of your dictionary at an honest level. Second is, uh, what do you say? One guy has revenue, another guy has product. It's like one guy who has a good revenue and the, uh, the things uh, like, he has proved it. Like, and second, he's in uh, building this MVP stage. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean, all of this is exciting, but this is you can't use the word safe out here. Um, if you are asking me what would I choose between the two, very difficult for me to without looking at the asset. But uh, and I should not even say what you should. But uh, yeah, look, I think don't think about safety with startups. Right, last question. Okay, you can, you can go. You can go, go ahead with the question. Sorry, I can't. Only mutual fund. Yeah. So uh, let me first answer the first question. So your question is, so when we were born in 2019, the name of our product was in wealth. And then we changed that to in money. So there were basically uh, two reasons. Uh, one reason was that the opportunity that we saw was to deliver a super finance app in the hands of the users. So the, what the app does is much more than just investing. It really is a control center for you and your family to manage your entire money not just investing, right? You can pull your expenses, you can pull. So if you bank with ICICI, Kotak, HDFC, you can pull all of these banks real time into the app. If you bought mutual funds with someone, you can pull all of them here without doing anything, with just simple OTPs, highly secure. It's really powerful. It sketches your net worth and tells you how does the future look like. It tells you, it optimizes your expenses. So it does a lot on the dashboard and it's personalized so a cold user won't see it a warm user would, a hot user would see something else. So that was one reason why we changed, because we wanted to massify. Initially, I wanted to keep this for the top 1 million users. <laughs> but when we started building, we realized that there is a need to democratize, to make this accessible. Nobody's really kind of solving this. The second reason was that there's a the domain, right? So the domain uh, that we had was .in. Uh, we found this domain in money.com and ind.money, which will help us in the future on SEO and which will help us, you know,
get better kind of recognition. The third reason was also trademarks. So, you know, we were able to trademark this brand. So multiple reasons. We did this earlier in the day, which I thought was right. Your other question was, I think, on asset, like, what was the no, asset? So or active? Active stock picking or passive investing? Yeah, so out of 100 folks who want to invest in public QT, how many of them actually should go to stock picking versus, hey, uh, just go with uh, mutual fund rather than actually going with stock picking? Yeah, look, I mean, I think so. If you are, I, you know, I can give you my view. Uh, my personal view is that uh, you want to, like I personally uh, go and pick up indexes and ETFs because that's most passive. And I do it in a very, very systemized manner, which really helps to compound. And other than that, the companies that you love, the companies that you believe in that, yeah, the economics of this company is good, the PE is good, the XYZ is good, that's what you should do. If you are not actively looking at the markets, picking stocks is not a great idea because you can't keep a track. Uh, but if there are few companies and indexes, that's the way to go. Sorry. You know what's funny is that... Uh all of these these questions, they can actually get in touch with any advisor on the In Money app. But India's mindset is such that I'm going to ask the CEO how to do it. Right? So, uh, thank you everybody for, uh, for spending your time with us. Thank you, Ashish, for solving problems for I don't know how many people. And on behalf of all of us, thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you. <laughs>